So today we're starting a new summer series, four-week series over the summer called Summer Shorts. Um, Each week we're going to be looking at a book of the Bible which is short in length but has a big message for us. So in a minute, I'm delighted that Stuart's going to come and speak to us. Um, But before he does, I'm going to read the whole of 2 John, so not the gospel, but the letter in the New Testament. So this is uh, 2 John, it's not that long obviously, this is 2 John. It says, the elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the, in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. So let's welcome Stuart as he comes to speak to us. Well, thank you. Well, it's been a special week. We have a new prime minister and uh, we're going to talk this morning on truth. (laughs) Uh, our duty is to, our duty is, whatever it is, to pray for people, seriously. But we do live in perilous times. We live in times where there's a lot of fake news and uh, what is truth. And as Christians, we realize it's a hard thing being a Christian. We're under constant attack, constant spiritual attack. It's not easy being attacked. And, and the Apostle Paul says, you know, we, 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 our fight is against principles and powers, not against people. And he says, you know, be strong in the Lord and put on the whole armor of God. Now the thing is, the first bit of armor, he says, he says, have the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the first thing as a Christian you have to do, as well as being strong in the Lord and his mighty power, we have to put on the belt of truth. And this is really what 2 John is all about. So let's look at 2 John. As we do live in perilous times. We live in times when the language has been devalued and the good has been called evil and evil has been called good. And and, uh, I don't think, I'm very grateful that I'm to be able to do this passage. Whether we'll get through it all, I'm not sure. But there's nothing more relevant actually we should see than what John is talking about. It's about AD 90, 95, 1900 years ago. John, Hobutaros, the old man, the elder, the only time in the New Testament where it's elder is singular. So he's the last of the apostles. He's writing from Ephesus. And uh, I said nothing can be more relevant than what he's saying to, to us. It's only short, 245 words. You can get it all on a on papyrus. It's a postcard really, isn't it? And he writes to this chosen lady. Well, there's a great debate on who is this chosen lady. Is it an individual lady? The commentaries I've got are divided. Um, Or is it, I would probably go with John Stoughton, it's a a metaphor for the church, the bride of Christ. Uh, We won't argue over it. You may think it's to a single lady or to... uh, a group of people. I don't think actually a, a man would write to a woman, a singular woman in uh, verse 4, I ask that we love one another. I think it's a more a corporate thing myself. 
But we won't debate that this morning. The priority is the truth. The priority is the truth. Nothing is more important than the truth. Nothing. It's more important than worship. It's more important than prayer. It's more important than evangelism. Because if you get the truth wrong, you get worship, prayer and evangelism, everything wrong. It, it's the foundation. It feeds everything. And, and truth is of infinite value. Um, you see, you may say, well, it's very academic. My friend, only truth can deal with the problem you have this, this morning. And, uh, and so it's, it's really incredibly important. It's, it's, truth is the fount of life, of joy, of salvation and peace. It's only the truth, says Jesus, that can set you free. If you know it and work it out. So, so it's, nothing is more important. Well, people say, well, happiness is the greatest thing. You know, a quote there, the great Liverpool apostle, Ken Dodd, you know, happiness is the greatest thing. Well, it isn't really. It can be very self-centered, very indulgent. Now, we say, well, I say love is the greatest thing. Well, love itself can be very sentimental and emotional. It should lead to love, but love is not the foundation. I say peace is the, the, the big thing we're after. Even peace can be very self-centered. You know, I just want a, a quiet life, a peaceful life, a bit of peace. So it's not the important. Truth is the important thing. Uh, it is the driving force of everything. And so we've got to live by the truth. Or oh, why should we live the truth? Well, God, our Father, is the, is the God of truth. He's, uh, I could quote many scriptures. God who does no wrong, who is upright, just and holy is he. Everything about him is truthful. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. When he was on trial before Pontius Pilate, Pilate says to him, what is truth? And... uh, if he, if he would know that truth was there incarnate before him. Jesus says, the reason I came to earth was to bear witness to the truth, to testify the truth. And I'm going to say, and the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, is a spirit of truth. Jesus says, when he comes, he will lead you into all truth. So truth is, is the key thing, really. And... Um, Daniel says that the Bible is the book of truth. And it's only the truth, my friends, that can set you free. This is not an academic exercise we're doing this morning. Many of us are full of guilt and fear and anxiety. Only the truth, as it's worked into you, can set you free. So it's, it's incredibly important. We will be judged by the truth. This is what will judge us when we stand before the, or God in that final day. We are to worship in spirit and in truth. It's all to do with that. But the trouble is, we live in a world of lies. You will lie, I'm told, statistically 126,000 times in an average lifetime. Men lie twice as much as women. No comment. <laughs> Apparently it's true that. But we do live in a world of lies. One else, a friend of mine last month, he books a hotel in West London to see his son two or three nights. It was Holiday Inn, 40% off. So he, he books it online and then he rings them. Of course, they'd never heard of him. It was a scam. It was only two or three hundred, about more than that probably. It was a good hotel. So he rings his bank and when he goes to his bank, he, he was a banker, so he, and he says, yeah. Tells them the story. He says, yeah, I'm, we're sorry. We will in, in reimburse you, we, you know, from your card. And my friend said, well, I'm very sorry. He said, sir, we will be scammed 10,000 times today out of this bank. So my friend <laughs> nips across the road to his own bank. He said, I must change the, the password or whatever it is. So he goes across to his own bank and he says, he tells them about the previous bank. And they say, 10,000 times. They said, sir, if we were only scammed 10,000 times a day, we would think we were having a very, very good day. <laughs> my, friend, my nephew tells me he was a banker. The banks in Britain lose £700 a second just by scams. Now, 
I could illustrate, that that's just one aspect of dishonesty and lies. We live in a world of lies. And we are called to live by the truth. And we must get back to the text. <laughs> so the church is to be, Paul says to Timothy, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. John is writing from Ephesus. In Ephesus, there's the temple of, to Diana, Diana of the Ephesians, 127 pillars, marble pillars, coated with gold, with precious stones in it, supporting this godless, demonic edifice. Now Paul says, and John would say the same, we as a church, the church of Jesus Christ, what we stand for is to stand for the truth. We uphold the truth. We're a pillar of the truth. And um, now we will be rejected, my friends, if we, if we as stewards of the truth. We have to get this, in, especially in the coming days. We will be rejected, we'll be reviled, we'll be called bigoted and narrow and divisive. Never forget that. It's going to get worse rather than better. You know, we're not here just to sing songs. I was in Oxford. Every time I go down Broad Street, I see the cross on the ground where the men died for the truth. You go to Amersham, you see the pillar for the lollars when men and women were burnt for the truth. We're talking big things, my friends. The truth is the the one thing that matters in life. And, well, what is the truth? We we better get on to it. It's not going to say, well, you know, it it would be wonderful to... uh, to be in the first century. You want to read a bit of first century. How they were persecuted for their faith. And uh, the devil is always set to undermine the truth. Well what is the truth? Well very simply. It comes from outside. It's not something we sit down and cogitate and think about. It is something that comes from outside. It is given Paul says, and the other apostles say, we don't make this stuff up. He says, the gospel I preached you, for what I received, I pass on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. I received it. It's not something I made up. It's not something, that's what this book's about, my friends. This is the truth. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's not something men sat down and thought about. That's philosophy. I studied philosophy at university. And it's a fine subject. But it's not what we're about. We're talking about revealed truth. Given. It's not the you know, majority vote. It's not you know, truth is in the eye of the beholder. No, it's given. We, it's received. It's not the thoughts of men, wonderful though they may be. Therefore, it has eternal value and consequence. And... Um, and uh, we have to hold on to it. It's not for debate or discussion or uh, you know, inter- personal invitation. It is take it or leave it. It's a given. It's given. It's been given. It comes from outside. It's totally trustworthy. You know, we stand as a fellowship and this is our testimony. This word is, test- is truthful and it's reliable. Well, let's get to the text. We see the first four verses, these Christians, five times, whom I love in the truth, who know the truth, the truth which lives in us. It has given me great joy to find that some of your children walk in the truth. The thing, it's, it's the central thing, it's given. The thing, it unites us. All the, we're united because... We have a common belief in the truth. That's what knits our heart. It's the love for the truth. Go back to 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves the Son. God has given a love into our hearts. It's in the truth. It's the truth that binds us together. But not only that... John says here, the truth lives in us, verse 2, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. See, the Holy Spirit comes and he puts the Spirit, he he writes the law of God in our hearts, the new covenant. He he puts it in our heart. He said, to go back to 1 John, you know, 
You have an anointing from the Holy One. All of you, all Christians, are in one measure have an anointing from the Holy One and you, and, and you know the truth. And Paul can then say of all Christians in one sense, you have the mind of Christ. Why? Because the Spirit has come into all Christians, brought us to life and put the truth in us to some measure. And the, and, and the truth of God never changes. And it's the source of, of all blessing. And he, and he says that in verse 3, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, and the Father's Son, will be with us in truth, in truth and love. It all, everything comes from the truth, my friends. Salvation, mercy, health, provision, glorification, holiness, everything. Every good thing comes from knowing and living out the truth. We, uh, I'm involved with a charity called Rope that some of us have supported for many years and we've sunk many wells in India and all around the world. I remember one in North Ghana we put in. I say we, somebody else did it for us. Um, and this village, the kids were all being ill and, um, and sick and the adults were sick and we put this well in. The, the village changed because they had a source of pure water and it brought life and vitality. That's why this is so important. It brings, it brings life. You see, we have to ask the question every Sunday, every day, what is the basic problem in life? Have you listened to the news this morning? Is it, well, it's global warming. And, well, if it's global warming, we need environmentalists and the government to get their act together and do something, or whatever. Or is it, some say, well, no, the, the real problem is education. okay. Well, we need some good educators. No, no, the real problem, the psychotherapists say, we need, it's alienation, whatever that means. Well, we need some psychotherapists. No, no, the real problem um, is, and Marxists and others says, is money. <laughs> it's money. That's what it's about, money. What do we need in Britain? More money, right. That's to solve all our problems. So, well, we need some good uh, financial wizards then, it seems. But anyway. No, the real problem, some say. The answer is sexual. That's the problem. Well, we need to dig up some, uh, someone like Sigmund Freud to sort our problems out. But if I want to contend, and we want to contend, that the real problem is that we, men, man, and women were created in the image of God. And we've said to God, we will will run our own life. We will run our own life. We raise our fist to God and we say with Mrs. Nader, we'll do it my way. And because of that, we are cut off from God. We stand opposed to him. We'll do our own thing. We stand as rebels. I I can see the real need in the world. And church, we have to get this, this. Because the great danger is to do other things legitimate, but not the main thing. The real problem in the world and in Britain is that men and women are cut off from God. The real issue, there needs to be reconciliation. That's what we exist for. Now, there are other things that are legitimate and valid, but this is the key thing. And the wonderful thing is this. In the face of the rebellion... God has invaded our planet. And he's done that by coming in none other than the person of his son. He stepped on earth. Stepping on the moon was wonderful. But God stepping on the, on the earth is infinitely more wonderful. And he comes to a rebellious race. And he comes to die. God comes to die to deal with our rebellion on that cross. And in some wonderful way, he he deals with it on the cross. He bears your guilt and your sin and your vileness and your all all that you've done wrong on the cross. That we might be records. That is why, my friends, we are dogmatic. That is why we feel strongly about things. Because Jesus is the only light of the world. Well, the second thing John says, the truth is not only to be believed, but to be lived out. Verse 4, walking in the truth, not just talking the truth, 
We're good at that. We have to live in it. Verse 7. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. It's an old commandment in one sense. Ten commandments. First half of the Ten Commandments, first five, are to our attitude to God. The second five are our attitude to, to, to others, to, to men and women around about us. Now Paul sums it up wonderful as Romans says, love is the fulfillment, is the fulfilling of the law. The fulfillment of the law. Now in one sense, John in his previous letter, if you know one John, says... In, <laughs> I am writing a new command. He just said in the second letter, it's 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 an old command. But John said it's new in the sense that, well, he says in 1 John 2, it's new, it's a new command. Its truth is seen in him, that's Jesus, and in you. Because the darkness is passing and the true light has already come. In other words, it's, it's old because it's always been there. But it's new because, Paul, we've seen it in him. Sorry, John says we've seen it in him. We've seen him demonstrated in a man, in the, in the, the God-man Jesus. And not only, it's, John says, it's not only seen in him, it's seen in you. Seen in us. Yes, because now, the new covenant has started. Now, God has put out his spirit on all his people. Not just a few prophets and kings, etc. But it's all people. God has poured his love into our hearts, says Paul, by the spirit he has given us. It's a new day. It's a new day. He says, the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining, says John. We've seen it in him. It's now the spirit of God is in you. This is, you can do this stuff now. Romans 8, 3, the righteous requirements of the Lord can now be fulfilled in us. Anyway, we must keep to the text. It's in, it's in us. And, and he has transferred, says Paul, says Paul, from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the son he loves. We, we, we're, we're, we're now able to keep the law of God. And Paul, John, and all of them say the same thing. Our love is defined by keeping the commandments. We are not put right with God by the commandments. We're put right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. But because now as new creatures we're able to live that way, we have to live by the commandments. <laughs> and we delight in them. That's how our love is defined. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Our love is expressed by how we obey the word of God. That's what it's about. That's what love is about. It's not anything emotional. Or in fact, oh, let me just cut to the quick. If you have sex with someone before marriage, or out of marriage, or of the same of your same gender, it is wrong. It is sinful. It is inappropriate because it is contrary to this word. Now you may say, "Well, we very, we love each other. You don't know how we feel for each other." I I am not doubting that for a minute, but that's not what the Bible calls love. Love is fulfilling the word of God. Anything else is, well, call it what you like, love, infatuation, lust, <laughs> call it what you like, but it's not love. And that, that's what John is saying. We, we fulfill it by, we fulfill God's heart and desire by keeping his commands. That's what it's about. You see, and our, to love is to do his commands. If I, if I love you, I will not speak evil of you. I will only speak that which is for your good. If I love you, I will not murder you or destroy your name or reputation. I will only speak good of you. If I love you, if I'm married to you, I will not divorce you and marry another and commit adultery. I will stay faithful and I will keep my vows as long as I live. I will not steal from you. Your reputation, your time, your money, your property. I will only seek to bless you. I will not lie to you and bear false witness. I will only seek to bless you. I will seek constantly to to bless you, to comfort you, to encourage you, to correct you. All that is needed to build you up as a human. 
That is what love is, keeping the law of God. But the final thing is this, and we could, these are just headings this morning. The, the, the final thing he says is, it's not simply to, keep, to love his law and to embody in love, we have to defend the truth. We don't just love the truth, embody the truth, we have to defend the truth, says John. Now the whole letter is, is about what was happening was, the early church met in homes, and in, as, the, as the gospel went through the east of the Mediterranean, they would meet in different homes. And the apostles, prophets, pastors, and evangelists and teachers would go and up the road on their horse or camel or whatever, trek up the road to the next town, and you would, the believers would welcome them in. You were encouraged to practice hospitality. You had to do. They couldn't afford to stay anywhere else. And actually most of the hotels and so-called were no more than brothels, really. They were very ill inns of ill repute. And your duty and your desire was to be hospitable and loving. Because the, the, the church was not built, not meeting in places like this, but usually in homes. Now then, the, what was happening is that certain people were going round. John, they went out from us. Now Jesus says that we'll do this next month when we do Jude. Jesus said that they will come. They will they'll be look, look like sheep, but really they're wolves. Paul says the same in Acts 20, doesn't he? They'll come from within us. The church has never really suffered from persecution. In, in one sense, what kills the church is always from within inside. Really. If you study the statistics and the facts. And that's how it works. And they come as an angel of light, says the Apostle Paul. And in the same, this is what was happened. We're not talking about atheists or Buddhists or Muslims or Hindus. We're talking about professing so-called Christians. And they were going round. And uh, they were deceiving. They were deceiving. Now, they they may be nice. Now, I could apply it today if we had time. We haven't time. You know, because this is the devil's most successful method, always. Let the virus get into the body. Let the terrorists have their cell inside the country. This always works very effectively. And, uh, and these, these men were going around, and um, they, always have a new, a new, they always have a new slant on things. They always have some new revelation, you know. And they're always spiritual. They're always very religious. And they know the Bible as such. And, uh, but you have to know a counterfeit note. That's how they train them in the, fraud, in the fraud squad. You handle the real thing. If you want to know what counterfeit currency is, you keep handling the real thing. You know? 50 pound note, 100 pound note, as you would know. And you keep, to, to know the false, you handle the real. And that's why we, have, we teach on a Sunday and other times, Right? Now the ultimate test, my time is nearly gone, my, the ultimate test of these people is what is their attitude to Christ? What is their attitude to Christ? Well, to put it very briefly, they were denying two things. Because it's always to do with what people think of Christ. They were saying that Christ had not come. In other words, he had not pre-existed. They were making a division. There's the cosmic Spirit and there's a man Christ. Two persons. That's what they're saying. And at his birth, the cosmic Christ comes into the man Jesus. At his death, this cosmic Christ goes back. Totally wrong. There are, there's only one Christ. One person. He is fully God and, and he comes from the Father. He pre-existed and he comes and becomes a man. Fully man. So the first thing they were denying that he had come. In other words, they were saying he didn't have a future. It's, you know, he was just he became a, a man indwelt by the Spirit. He is more than that. He is fully God and fully man, right? One person. The second thing they were saying was he hadn't come in the flesh. Oh, it appeared that way, but he wasn't really. Now that I, the point is this, if he hadn't come in the flesh, he hasn't suffered. God is still in his heaven. Well, the, the poor man Jesus, whoever he is, the indwelt, this man indwelt by the Spirit, he's, 
But God himself has not come and suffered. And so if there's no suffering, my friends, there is no atonement. You see, you and I have sinned as men and women. And we will be punished by God because we have broken the law of God. And man must suffer the sins for man. Therefore, the gospel is this. God becomes a man and dies in your place. That's the gospel. And he died and he suffered. And that's what it's about. These people deny that he had come in the flesh. He just appeared that way. You see, they were denying the full deity of Christ and they were denying that he suffered. So this is, these, are, these aren't just trivial things. This, this is the heart of what it's all about. And, uh, and John is saying, you, are, you must be seriously, you, you are seriously warned if you, if you watch out or you'll lose out. But you know, they're such nice people. I don't care whether they're nice people. They're just a lovely man, so spiritual. I don't care. What do they say about the, the Bible? What do they say about Jesus? But he, he's an archbishop. He lectured at university. He taught a scripture at school. Such wonderful lady, wonderful. What do they say? You see, whether they're JWs, whether they're Muslims, whether they're Mormons, in many ways they say the same thing. They say, well, we believe in God. Yes, but is he a Trinitarian? Is he Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? That is the true God. Oh, we believe in Jesus. Yes, but is he fully God and fully man? That is the true Jesus. Did he die in our place? Well, it was a very, it's a wonderful example. Did he die as my substitute on the cross for me, the righteous for the unrighteous? Well, I... Did he rise bodily, physically from the grave? Or was he a juggling, a juggling game with bones? I don't care if he's archbishop, he lecture at university... They are false prophets. They are false teachers. And John says, keep them out. Now it sounds very intolerant, doesn't it? <laughs> My friends, if, I'm a, if you're a surgeon in the, in the hospital, I want you to be very intolerant of that. You're, you're operating theatre. Keep the bugs out, my friends. This is more deadly, my friends, than every, any Novichok and any nerve gas. This is more virulent than any Ebola virus. I have seen friends of mine who were once followed the Lord have been decimated. Their life has been ruined. We're not just talking about a sermon. We're talking about lives ruined. Careers finished because they've taken the wrong path because they've listened to the wrong people, read the wrong books and all that stuff. When we're talking about the glory of God has been trampled on by... And it's so subtle, you see, my friends. That's why half the epistles have to do with this. And John is the real shepherd. He loves the people. Because he knows the truth. My time has gone. He knows the truth is the only thing that sets people free. The only thing that can get you into heaven and out of hell is the truth. The only thing that can put your life right is the truth. The only thing that can give you real joy and peace and satisfaction is the truth. Well, what is the truth? I'm not sure. I'm not very intelligent. Well, let me put it very simple. Jesus says, I'm the truth. Follow him and you'll walk in the light of life. Right? And John says, don't let these people in the house, don't even greet them. You don't have to be rude, just shut the door. Right? (laughs) Because he said, if you don't, he says, anyone who who welcomes him shares in his wicked ways. He said, well, you have to be tolerant. You have not to be tolerant with error, my friends. It has killed the church in Britain almost. We'll talk about this when we get to Jude, perhaps. No, no. You've got it, my friends. John says, I'm delighted that you love the truth. I'm delighted that you're walking in the truth. You love each other. But he said, I just pray that you'll guard the truth. Amen?